Yes. I graduated from high school in 1967, and I'm on the Facebook page for my high school. And um, somebody started talking about, um, well, there was not segregation in 1967. Our all-white school just reflected the neighborhood yeah, without right. any idea that people were systematically kept out of the neighborhood, right, right. you know, and that there were, there were black families that lived much closer to the high school than I lived, but I was in a white working class neighborhood, so they bust us in, yeah. you know, to, to the nicer school and, you know, segregated the black kids, you know, in an inner city school. And the resources that go to those schools Absolutely. as opposed to the other schools. It's Absolutely. Atrocious. Well, it's all based on property taxes. But it's amazing right. to well, me that they still... Well, I'm saying yeah. that they don't. Yeah. 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 That, that those students it isn't, it isn't still haven't figured that out. You know, that that their, their, their skin privilege was, you know, um, part of their upbringing. And, the only right. positive responses you got were from the boy. Yeah, yeah. The only positive responses I got were from um, from uh, African American students who had graduated. Who when the when the neighborhood started, you know, changing and they started going to school, they said we thought that was what was going on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. So. Um, you know, and there were all kinds of other problems as well. I mean, violence, right? Extra legal violence. The the Ku Klux Klan, of course, um, um, comes back um, and uh, responds to Brown versus Board of Education and the other, the 1964 Civil Rights Act and, and the 1965 um, uh, Voting Rights Act. And um, so you do have people that are advocating, right, at the highest levels. I mean, JFK. Uh, Linda Johnson, uh, Martin Luther King, you have high profile people that are advocating for a change. And so this, this segregation does ha end um, at least legally and in part socially, right? I mean, there are uh, public accommodations now that can't um, uh, discriminate based on race. You, I mean, Denny's tries every now and then, <laughs> but they get shut down, right? They get, I mean, there are ways that um, that gets overcome. So now what, right? Now it's the 1960s. These Civil Rights Act have been passed. The Voting Rights have been, Act has been passed. Brown versus Board of Education is finally starting to get implemented a little bit. And the conservative whites who don't want this racial order to change say, what are we going to do now? And so they focus on crime. Um, they find an answer, and the answer is mass incarceration. Um, so um, they start talking about a breakdown in law and order as the civil rights movement is at its height. Right? There's some civil disobedience that's going on. Riots break out in a few cities, and um, the conservative uh, racist whites of course, not all whites, but conservative racist whites um, start to say there's a problem with um, law and order, and we're going to clamp down on this. They don't call it racial uh, law and order problems, right? They use neutral language, but that's who they're focusing on. So um, 1964, uh, Barry Goldwater and his presidential campaign aggressively exploited the fear, the riots, of um, black crime and really laid the foundation for this get tough on crime movement that emerges a decade later and is, I would argue, still with us today. Um, the Republican Party invokes the Southern strategy, I'm sure you've heard of that, right, where they use law and order rhetoric among working class whites and an intense um, resentment of racial reform to get Southern whites to switch over to the Republican Party um, create a new majority in the White South, and uh, Nixon's 1968 campaign does this with a purpose, right? He's quoted as saying, we'll go for the racists, right? That's who's going to help him get the victory. Um, the theories of crime causation that emerged um, said that rather than poverty being at the root of crime, it was a pathology, and it was a pathology rooted in black culture. Mm -hmm. So that's the way that they started to change uh, the way that we looked at crime as well, right? All of these sociological arguments that I talked about at the beginning um, that had been prominent in the 1960s started to be attacked, 
And that's when we have this switch from ideas of rehabilitation and treatment um, and mediation and uh, restorative justice, and we get the get tough on crime, lock them up, put them away. Attica. Yeah. Attica? Is that what you said? Yeah. 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 So um, Nixon made this law and order uh, a central part of his campaign, and he issued the first call for the war on drugs. Now, it doesn't really get going until Reagan gets in office, but Nixon talks about it, right? Reagan picks up this call, um, this call for a war on drugs, after he's elected. By 1982, just two years right after he takes office, not even, the Justice Department cut in half the number of specialists assigned to identify and prosecute white-collar crime. They cut in half. They're, they're uh, part of the Justice Department that was working on white-collar crime, and they turn their attention to street crime. This is the federal Department of Justice, uh -huh. and they're concerned now with street crime, right? So they have a little bit of a debate about that. Should the federal Department of Justice be concerned with local communities' problems of street crime? But they somehow get around that. That doesn't seem to stop them. And um, uh, they start uh, focusing on uh, um, drugs. They say this is the problem. Now you got to remember, this is 1982. The crack uh, cocaine epidemic hasn't happened yet, right? It doesn't happen for over a, a decade. So they're focusing on it before it's in the public eye, before anybody realizes that it's a problem, and before local police departments think it's a problem. So the federal government has to figure out how to get local police departments on board and follow them with this war on crime, because it's not obvious to them. Enter bobblehead Nancy Reagan with her just say no. It's, that was a big part of it, right? To bring socially people along. They have this huge public service campaign, public service announcements, right? And they start talking about just say no, and that's, isn't that when they did the egg, this is your yeah. brain, yes. <laughs> drugs, brain <on> drugs. <laughs> yes. right? So they have this huge campaign. It wasn't obvious to anyone that it was a problem, least of all local police departments. So local police departments were like, look, that's not not the crime that we have in our neighborhoods. That's not the things that are concerning us. We're not buying into this. So how does the federal government get a local community to buy into it? Well, they, they come along with that <laughs> later, yeah. but it's money, right? We'll give yeah, you aid yeah. if, you, if you do this. So um, they create this budget for federal law enforcement. So the federal law enforcement budget um, sort um, uh, for the, from 1980 to 1984. Um, just one example, they created the FBI um, anti-drug funding, right? Increased from $8 billion in 1980 to 95 million, excuse me, $8 million in 1980 to 95 million. Eight to 95 million in four years. And every other department did as well. They just channeled all of this money into um, the federal drug, uh, uh, the federal, uh, uh, law enforcement departments, all of them, the range of them. And then, in addition to Nancy Reagan's campaign, they started talking about crack babies, they started talking about crack whores, gang bangers, bangers right? And they used neutral, race-neutral language, but all the images were racial images. Welfare right? queens. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Um, and um, and then they, you know, focused on the black communities. By the mid 1990s, the system was in place. Um, no Democrats, no Republicans, no one was talking about any sort of alternative to the Get Tough movement. Everybody bought in, Democrats alike, right? Bought into this movement on the war on drugs. And this is when the sentences for those that were convicted of drug offenses really took off, right? They, they the legislators. Late legislature started to put in place these get tough uh, sentences, particularly for drug offenders. Right? Um, they also then started to create all of these additional hardships for people who had been convicted of a felony. Right? So you, in lots of states, you lost your voting privileges, um, sometimes forever, sometimes for a while. Um, you also could get, you would get kicked out of public housing. Right? And you don't even have to have a conviction for that. Um, you, um, 
can't get loans, can't get food stamps, can't uh, get uh, uh, access to education. So, you know, it's not only that they put these people, gave them felony convictions and put them in prison. When they got out, they gave them nothing, right? No place to live, no job, right? Try getting a job with a felony conviction. No food stamps, no uh, housing. aid, no housing, nothing. Education, nothing. nothing. Yeah. And in yeah. many states, voter disenfranchisement. Right, right. I, I would like to point something out yeah. from the labor movement here. Uh, if someone wants to get into the operating engineer's uh, training classes, they do not check to see if you have a felony conviction. So they don't hold that against you. That's great. They, tr they, they do give you a merit test, though. The yeah, that's another yeah. policy that's that they're not, that, not that the <laughs> engineers. You have to wow. be related, though, to somebody else. Get in there. No, you don't. Not, wow. if, not if, you, if you go in through the program, for their apprenticeship program. Well, that's great. Yeah, and they're actively looking for minorities and women for their apprenticeship program. That's great. Yeah, so by the mid-1990s, 90% 90 of prison inmates um, that were incarcerated for drugs were black or Latino. 90%. Um, and uh, the war on drugs is the primary reason for this system of mass incarceration. So the reality of the criminal justice system is that if you are uh, poor and you're arrested for a crime, you don't get a trial, you don't get an attorney, to represent you, or you do one that's completely over. And I'm not going to trash public defenders here. I know a lot of public defenders that are great people, good lawyers that are committed, but they're completely overworked, um, overextended. Their caseloads are ridiculous, and they have no resources. Right. Right. They don't have a team of investigators. So, they they're, so they're not as likely to push something and say somebody they has don't. the resources. They, they, they just don't. They're, they're going to take whatever deal the prosecutor gives them and get through the caseload. Exactly. <laughs> and plea bargains are the worst possible insidious <laughs> part of the criminal justice system for the poor because people plead guilty to things that they haven't done in order to avoid a harsher sentence because they believe that they're not going to be found um, not guilty even when they are, and then, it, you know, worst possible scenario, they get a felony conviction, and then all of these other things kick in. Even if they don't go to prison, all of these other things kick in. Another, you know how you drew the parallel between the crime thing? Another one that has just been, like, screaming at me recently is exactly what you say. People will go in and they will plea and admit that they, you know, confess to a crime they didn't commit. And at the same time, we have Herman Cain saying, I paid these women off, but I didn't do it because I didn't get convicted. So it's sort of a plea bargain in reverse. Right. It's saying, I will give you money if you drop the case so I'm not convicted, right. but if you're poor, right. you're going to, yeah, it's the exact same thing. Yeah. Yeah. And he wants to run for president. <laughs> that's a whole nother discussion. Yes, yes. <laughs> All right. so our system rewards the lie. That's what this whole system is about. Is it's just a rickety scaffold and buildings yeah. and everything, and it's all connected by lies. Yeah. Well, and and that's the next point, right? Is that this goes at every level. So the Supreme Court has supported this war on drugs. Um, decision after decision, they've rolled back Fourth Amendment protections uh -huh. from search and seizure. Um, they've approved mandatory drug testing. Somebody just mentioned that for employees, for students. They've upheld random searches of public schools and students. Um, my kids, uh, my daughter's a senior in high school, and she said the police come in all the time with dogs, you know, once or twice a semester, sometimes three times. And they just let the dogs go up and down the hallways, find the locker pull the kid out of class, take him away in handcuffs. Is there any resistance on the part of the uh, kids? Um, sometimes, but usually they bring enough force that... But no, yeah, yeah all the students, no. I think they're all sitting there wondering if it's going to be them. They're yeah. 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 If you're not doing anything wrong, you don't have to be worried. Yeah. <laughs> I graduated in 84, and we were complaining about yeah. it big time then. Yeah. Like, we thought we were completely being, you know... Yeah. Violated. You know, now, by the time my kids got to school, so there's just a fast. I mean, it's been a while. 
Yes. So, so there's, you know, the, the high school kids are passive. They're passive. Oh, high sure. school kids have no rights. It's yeah. ridiculous. I'm not talking about the rights. I'm saying how do they take that? Like, they take it. Normal. It's yeah. normal. It's accepted. They suck it up. It's, it's like everything. You, you know, you hit somebody. You hit somebody one time, and they don't stand up to you. Then you hit them the second time, and then it becomes normal to get hit. You know, it's yes. like that kind of system. Well, they've been they've been trying to weed out the deviants from the obedience for a long time at this point, mm. and the more people and you'll notice the, the fuck ups of society where they end up they either end up in jail or they end up doing really great things depending on how they handle plain bullshit on how rich like their parents are, which really is obe is how well they can blend into obedience and uh, fuck that. I've long, I've long, I've long, I've long wondered how That's Benny. how you uh, how you teach the Constitution as required in high schools that do it's not required random locker, locker <laughs> yeah well you know with the, well the courts have well, supported them yeah the courts have supported the constitutionality of these searches I mean I, I remember when I was in high school and they would do the searches. They would say code red over the thing. Teachers would lock the doors. I mean, there was nothing the students could do. They locked. They literally locked you in the room till it was done. And you know, they, they start being teaching you at a young age to be, you know, docile. Oh my yeah. God. Yeah. Well, things then they hold so many thoughts. things over their heads. I mean, these are kids that are, you know, gonna. Kind of, <laughs> what's your point, Drew? I was gonna say at the high school that I went to, the way you justified all those kinds of actions was by saying that they were an institution, and if you were part of an institution, you had to abide by whatever rules they decided to set. I don't know anywhere where it really works like that, uh, but that was their, that is their mindset that you have chosen, you, you are going to school, you have to do what we say. Even though you don't have a choice in the matter, in your adult life, you can work for a company or not work for a company, depending, you know, you can make decisions like, I don't want to work for an intrusive company that forces me to drug tests and yeah, you're goes you're required through my, to go to that school every you're being, day. You're That's forced right. into that institution, right. and, and yet they say that you... You have to abide by that. Like just to, just like as an exclamation point on how much it's changed. With my daughter's school, she's 25. They have literally they call for a group of teachers if they want to remove a student. A group of teachers come in and physically remove a student, mm -hmm. draw them out, just like the crush teams in the prisons. And they're doing that in our high schools every day. For what? What are, what are they being removed for? They did it to my daughter once because um, my niece got raped. And the, girl, the guy that raped her, her girlfriend, was saying she was going to burn down our house. And my daughter flipped out in class, as I would have too. <laughs> and she turned red and started shaking and started yelling. And... Four teachers came in and physically removed my four foot ten, ninety five pound dog. Like they need four teachers. Yeah. Well, the boundaries too. I don't know where it where it ends. I know that at my high school, they were bringing kids in for things that were happening off school grounds. I mean, they were. Right. Yeah. They went yeah. to the point where they said, "Look, if we don't say that you can park at the school, if we find you parked a few blocks away with the permission of the private property owner, we're still going to write you up for it." Because right. we said you cannot drive Smoking. to school. Smoking was one of the things they did that for. Mm -hmm. Well, I recall just a few years ago that uh, there was a student here in Springfield who was. Expelled because uh, they were having a locker to locker police search, and he put a note inside his locker that said, Bomb is in another locker. <laughs> I remember that. Which they construed as being a bomb threat. Oh, God. Rather than, now, and when I heard that story, I was like, that sounds like something I would have done. Yeah. <laughs> only, <laughs> only when I was in high school, I would have said, oh, I was just trying to help the police out. And, and they would have went, all right. Sean, you know. We? Um, I just wanted to say, I worked at uh, Kimmer Village for about four years in Assumption. 
and um, with the residents in the cottage, the child care counselors had very specific guidelines according to DCFS that they had to follow. Um, at one point in time, the campus got really violent, and so they started calling staff members up to the school. And in the school, because the school was part of the assumption of the school district, they had totally different rules. And that was the first thing they told all the staff members upon going to the school was that DCFS does not apply here. Wow. And so they were in in the school, like in the, in the uh, in in the cottage, that they'd have to be beating you to death before you could really put your hands on them and, and restrain them in the in the school. It didn't take them long at all before they called the the ex football player, forty five year old that weighed four hundred and fifty uh-huh. pounds, right. to sit there and rip them up out of their desk and throw them on the ground. That's exactly what they were doing to my daughter too. That's exactly what they were saying. Well, and. Did you ask me something? Oh, yeah. I just going to say uh, my experience with uh, being slightly deviant <laughs> in high school. Slightly. Uh, I wasn't as deviant then. <laughs> well, I was uh, sexually molested when I was a boy, and I was not a jock. And whenever I would be, I, first of all, I wore a trench coat. And when, oh, gosh. <clears throat> when the trench coat mafia thing happened and the uh, Columbine thing happened, I knew that I had a little more common sense than some of the other guys that I was friends with. I didn't go to school with my trench coat on. But they actually uh, would pull those kids out and they would they would try to talk them into dropping out because they weren't going to do anything with their lives anyway. Yeah. Just drop out. It would be better for you. And this is in Hillsborough High School. Well, I, I kind of, I had issues with showering with men who were, would take my towel and piss on it, or boys, really, or uh, take my stuff, because I wouldn't throw the football right or whatever. And so I tried to fight that based upon what had happened to me, and they ended up suspending me and expelling me because I wouldn't take a shower and be. So, <laughs> Which is bullshit. That's I mean, it's sexual, all about... It's sexual abuse, I'm yeah. sorry, but making someone get naked with strangers in, in anybody else's purview would be sexual abuse. So the but word, the school district's allowed to do it. The more deviant, like they, any form of deviance, even something like that, which I think is personal choice, it should be personal choice, uh, they would try to quench by it. And then they would be, they knew better than telling me to drop out. I was making good grades, they, but I ended up dropping out anyway for a semester. I came back anyways, but um, it was something that, I remember being in a high school government class and I put your big old anarchy sign on there, you know, and I, I took the class and I debated the whole way through it. And, uh, I would talk about deviance all the time because it's important to be a little deviant. How, how are you going to make? How are you going to progress if you're just like everybody else? You know. But they don't teach you that. They teach you to go to college and uh, wrap up that memorization. Memory. <laughs> and that stuff's great. College is great, but I'm, I'm proud to be a high school dropout. I, lo- I wear that like a badge of honor. <laughs> I figured out really <laughs> that I didn't like what they were teaching me, and I said no. You know. They don't care for that very much, but that stand, that that willingness to think for yourself is, I think, I have a Facebook group for other Lincoln Way dropouts, and you'd be surprised at how successful some of my, my peers in that regard have been. Like, I mean, some of them did, like myself, did very well once leaving that system, you know, which it does not reflect well on that system, I think. Yeah, but the problem is that uh, the... the um, Legislatures, local, federal, and uh, uh, law enforcement officers put into place rules, and then they enforce them, and then the courts come in and justify them. So you get trapped in this system, right? And um, that's part of what's going on here. I mean, the Supreme Court has said that those kinds of searches in high schools are okay. They aren't a violation of of the Fourth Amendment. They've also said that... um, Obtaining search warrants based on an anonymous tip are valid. Um, they've expanded, as I'm sure you're all aware, the government's wiretapping authority. Yes. <laughs> um, they uh, have legitimated the use of paid informants. They've approved of helicopter surveillance of homes without a warrant. Um, they've allowed for, and some of you were talking about this earlier, the forfeiture of cash and homes and other property. 